schedule, right? So right now, we're working on this curve modification. But the first one I'm thinking about is going to be when you guys want the paper to be due. We can either make it due on February 7th, or you can say this is all way. Sorry, it should be February 14th. Okay, so. So after the midterm. You'll understand our answers if we accidentally already said 12th, right? That's okay. Fine. So it'll be after the midterm. Um, I really want you guys to focus on studying for the, for the midterm. So that's where I'm like, uh, 
either I'd like to have a little bit before, uh, like space before a midterm, or if you guys want me to do it after the midterm, in the sense that y'all are going to focus on the midterm first, and then you're going to transition on the yeah. Would the short paper and the primary literature be due on the same day? Yes. That's, 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 that's your analysis of the paper. There's no two things. It's just oh, the so so primary so literature. So, the, oh yeah, so that day, what I'm thinking about, it was um, uh, we were in class. Yeah. Yeah, so we're in the class, we can reserve that day. If you guys want to uh, want to do it as a uh, as a three to read up with your group. You guys, we've already said they just paper. You guys can set up this group. If you come into class and meet up in the class itself, you guys said, hey, you want to meet up outside the class or go for coffee, whatever. Um, but I will be here that day just in case you guys were working as a group in the class and you have questions or stuff you want to go into. We can basically talk about it. Okay. So, okay. so we can do it. At, that second question was that either we do it as a review day where you guys can play with paper together here in class so you guys can ask questions. Or the other one is I can almost use it as a um, a pre-review. So what I'll do is I'll prep a lecture for that class, bring in the biggest points and the biggest things I want to talk about, and I'll lecture that that first class on the seventh. And then what we can do is on the ninth, then it'll be like an actual review session. Well, I'll let you guys bring up questions. If you guys don't have questions, I'm going to give some questions to ask you guys. So what would the seventh be? Um, so that's the second question. You can either do it as Okay, so like two review sessions. Yeah, so two review then, sessions or we do the uh, primary review. Can you mm -hmm. submit the form twice? Because when I submitted it, there was the second question was just type of question. Yeah, submit it again and then okay. uh, it'll just, uh, I'll just take your your <laughs> And then over the weekend, I need to read the paper, so I, I'll, I'll get back to you guys on Monday about um, some of the stuff that you guys found. But I glanced at the ones during the class, I think you guys have some good stuff. Just need a question. I feel like we could maybe mention something like this in class when we have fun. What do we have? What would you be opposed to putting like a study guide type thing together? Um, just stuff that you definitely know. That that's, that's the slide that I want to see you to make for this thing. Okay. So we end up having it as a literature day. If you guys want to work on your papers? I'll still make those slides, like my my my, uh, my main slides that I use for studying. And I'll give you all the papers. I can reload it. It's done. Right, awesome. I guess I got a little sick yesterday, so I wasn't feeling too awesome. My slides are, I feel a little bit soft today, like they're not super strong. Uh, sorry about that. Um, so for starters, right, we're going to get to this next level of regulation. And uh, we forgot to put the slide that we always put up, right? What's the center of dogma and gene regulation, right? So we worked our way down again from the DNA level. We got all the regulations together to the RNA. We went from the RNA to with all these different molecules that get us into the translation to actually make the protein. And now we're looking at the last end of the regulation pathway, or like first step of the last regulation, which is we're looking at what's happening to these proteins after they've been translated, right? So our focus today, post translation modification. Now for this one, we're going to go over several several different types, right? So there's different ways that you can enhance the shape, the structure, or the function of these proteins. And we'll be looking at how different molecules can actually help with that. I don't have really concrete examples of how they do it. Because if I do, I'm going to go super into the story, right? So I really want you guys to just get this idea of what are the types of modifications you guys can come to today. And then um, in some cases, I want you to think about kind of when I first started talking about how proteins work is they have binding sites and they have active sites, right? Places where they drive off things, places where they can actually modify things. All these signaling is going to be basically modifying one of these two things. Yeah? Right, so let's get into it. All right, so this is going to be our list. It's going to be a little bit more that show up on the inside. So for this one, I'm just going to feel comfortable. This is one of my favorites, phosphorylation. 
And then another important one is really going to be that you take new transformation. Um, phosphorylation is going to be UI in a phosphate group. I think we've seen that one a few times come up throughout the text. And of course, your big one is you, you're, you're making a modification to the protein, but this time you're kind of collating and bonding with a small little cut type here. Right. Here, we're going to be looking at, again, more markers. Your GPI anchor is basically now you're modifying or binding your protein through a sugar bond to actually link it up into a fat molecule so we can trap it in our uh, fat membrane, right, which are little fat bubbles. We have our like oscillation. We're going to go a little bit into that one, talking about the little about the different sugars. This one, when you're reading the text, be careful. It does love to go into each sugar in each part of the organ. Don't remember each type of sugar modification. Um, just know how the sugars get modified, and I'll give over the big effects. And finally, again, two more covalent modifications. In this, in this, in this, we have our methylation and acetylation. So, right, these are small covalent little groups you're going to raise it. So, single carbon, and the little bit of the ends. All right, let's get into it. All right, so this is really one of my favorite ones. Um, I, I, I've tried working with one of them, and it's super fun to chase down. So it's going to be your a protein phosphorylation and dephosphorylation. Right? In this case, what we're looking at, this is going to be the two different states. Right? On the left, you have the unphosphorylated version. On the right, you have your phosphorylated version. Normally, there's going to be two, uh, two amino acids. Your serines and your threonines, and your tyrosine, sorry, three. Um, these basically have an O group that kind of hangs off the side. Over here, showing the red. Or the, the last end, end of their R group, right? And in that place is where you can actually get them to get uh, the addition of this phosphate group, like the chair that's kind of shown in that. And this one's done by one enzyme, or it's done by another protein, which is called the protein kinase. Now, to get the opposite job done, job done you're going to have this thing called a uh, protein phosphatase. This is the complete opposite role, and it will remove that phosphate group from this protein. So now you can see that green protein can jump between these two different states, right? Unphosphorated, phosphorated. It's being done by these two, and these two different enzymes. Right? So just feel comfortable with like take, if I say, hey, you have an unphosphorated protein that gets modified, what enzyme would help catalyze that? You bring the protein kind of yeah? Now, when it comes to how this works, big picture-wise, the regulation, this is where it has a lot of variability because you can use this tool. Right? So, for example, in some cells, what they'll do is they might get like an upstream signal, like something comes onto the cell surface of that cell, the signal gets internalized, that signal goes and activates a protein kinase. That protein kinase will be like a specific one, and again, using those properties of enzymes. It has the proper confirmation, it knows how to grab onto the protein you care about, it also has the catalytic site that helps move the phosphate to the right? So. By regulating which kinases are expressed, we can determine what proteins are going to be phosphorated. At the same time, you also have signaling pathways that work on this side, which is signal gets put onto the cell surface, signal is internalized, it will activate specific phosphatases, and again, these phosphatases do the same thing. They have a specific shape to help find your target, right, with your binding pockets, then you have the catalytic site, which is going to help remove that, release that phosphate from it. No. And, um, so that's from the regulation side coming above it, right? And how do we get into having these two different states? Now, what the phosphorylation means to the protein, again, here it can mean two different things, and it depends on how the protein gets modified. So if we think about a protein being just two basic functions, you have to grab onto the thing you're working with, and you have to be able to cut. These phosphorylations can, can function by wherever they bind. They can either bind in a place really close by to these binding pockets, and it's going to bring this huge negative charge. Right? So, that big negative charge, if you had like a, now you have your pocket like this, and in here you have your OH group sitting out, you could potentially still be bringing in your molecules. The moment you bring in your negative charge into this pocket, you're going to change the chemistry here. You might block it to bind to the pocket. The cool thing about this, or the big flexibility thing about this, is like if in this protein this might be the mechanism, in other proteins it could be that phosphorylation somewhere else could make this thing change its conformation. Right? So that that ability to change the conformation can go both ways. So it could be in some proteins you might see that phosphorylation is the way to turn this thing on, and this protein will not work. 
And in other cases, phosphorylation could be the mark that turns it off and makes it back not even functional. Just how it can do it by blocking or inhibiting the binding site. It can also do it by binding or inhibiting the, um, the, the uh, catalytics. Right? So this is going to be a huge modification where it changes the protein. In some of them, it'll make them completely change shape. Like the one that I was trying to work with, it was kicking my butt. Was that? When it wasn't phosphorylated, it was opened up and it left the tag open. This tag basically sent it to a different compartment inside the cell. Once it was tagged, once it got phosphorylated, it would fold into itself, put this away, and now the protein can go to the proper environment. So I was trying to figure out why isn't it sticking to the different proteins, how is it changing its theory of binding DNA, all this stuff, different things that the protein can do, finding all these different targets, and then it was like, oh, it's a little tag that it hides and pops out. But here's the work, and it was kicking my butt. Thanks. But they're super cool, they're really powerful. Um, and I kind of here's what the, the point that I'm bringing up, right? Where it's just like, depending on what protein you're working with, the phosphorylation mark could be the signal that that's the thing that turns it on. But for a completely different protein, that modification could be completely different. And that could be the mark that actually turns it on. So I saw already in some of your primary literature papers, I think I was reading one of them, they bring up kinases and phosphatases. So when you think about this, um, or when you're bringing up your paper, make sure you mention which one you're working with, right? So let me know, hey, you're working with a kinase that's activating your system, then you're working at the top side, right? But if your kinase does the opposite and turns your new molecule off, then you're kind of working down here. All right, so let me see. So here's a little bit of a draw, a little bit of a, a way that we normally draw the proteins. We basically do these little like little rectangles from that end terminus all the way back here to the C terminus, that's one single amino acid chain, right? Like that's one polypeptide chain. Okay. We then, based on how you work with it, how you break it up, how you look at the different regions, we start guessing what different, uh, different domains can do with functions. And that's what we're seeing down here, right? So we're seeing that first part. It's a transactivation domain. That, if we go back to lectures like two and three, that's basically what helps act as an activation, right? So this part of the protein can be the thing that binds the general transcription factors to the also thing that helps modify the histones to open it up. That's what this part of the protein is. In this section of the protein, we have the DNA binding domain, right? So this will be that part of the protein that actually goes and helps find a specific target that we want to regulate. On the back end, you can see here you have this uh, spectralization domain. And just see that yellow region, what it does is um, when um, these proteins are binding to DNA, they use that ring part, they grab onto the cable, but in order to get like really good uh, affinity for a target, you normally have multiple of them working together, grabbing onto neighboring regions, right? So then if you imagine we have, I don't know how chalky it is. Like you have your piece of DNA like this, you might have a protein that's bound to DNA, right? So there you have a bit of like strength, you're holding onto something. Using these, the yellow region, the binding domain, it actually uses that to link up with a different protein. Right? This interaction basically gives you more strength as you kind of hang on. The other thing it does is, if, imagine here you have a specific sequence. Like let's say this one does A, 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 A DNA. In order for the next molecule to, like, to bind up, because it has to be the same thing, there has to be another little space region where you have multiple A, A, A in a row. Right? So, you can see it's a tetramere, so it means you have four of these molecules binding together. So before we said, hey, if a single molecule can only recognize and see four base pair, it seems kind of like four base pairs should be easy to come up, should be easy to find. But the fact that you can have four of these in a row, properly spaced out, that means that now technically the gene that you're going to regulate has to have this much level of information to pick your specific target. Right? So that'll give it a little bit extra power to this protein. And once we get to the back, here could be it's another regulatory domain. So this means that this could be something that helps with either repression or it could, um, I don't know what's it called, um, like it, it, it affects its ability to regulate other factors. So as a protein, all these domains have all these different jobs, right? That'll be the long story. What I want you to look at now is in the front end, right? Here is basically showing all the phosphorylation sites that we have in the front part. You can see phosphorylation. Ubiquitination. So, phosphate group, here you're adding a small protein, ubiquitin. Uh, Sumo is another small protein. 
This is like a different one. Uh, this is a single target chain. This is like the seal groups. When you add these, these are going to be able to change the function of this part of the protein, right? So you can imagine different levels of, of regulation can come in, right? We can have phosphorylation come in, modify the ability of this protein to activate, right? So it's still going to be able to bind DNA, but we can either determine whether it be an activator or it will be a repressor, right? The other one, heterogenization of the Again, you have the regulation to be able to turn this on or off. It's going to be, if it's off and they can't clamp up with each other, they won't sit very well on the DNA, right? That means that they might not find very well to pick your targets. And if you put the regulatory domain, that again, might turn, change that on or off switch, right? So there are like these little different independent tasks that just with these modifications, we can actually turn them on or turn them off depending on how the modification goes. All right, so that's how we can really control how a protein works, yes? What's the function of the transactivation domain again? Let me look it up for this one. The trans activation domain that's um, going to link up into two possibilities. I'm not going to, uh, if, uh, if I look it up, I can find specifically how this one does it. But there's two ways, right? One of them is it um, activates the general transcription, transcription factor, right? So I think it's in slide two or three where we talk about like there's a mediator complex holding kind of the general transcription factors. An enhancer comes in, hits it, and then the polymerase fires off. So that's one way they could do it. The other way is they do histone modifications. And here you're, you're basically, you know, they're going to bind to other proteins to bring in modifiers that are going to release the DNA. Mm -hmm. That would be your two mechanisms on the left. Thank you. Yeah. So I'm going to leave it open there, but in reality, this one might be specifically, it might use one or the other. I'm just not sure. I would have to look it up. All right, so at this point, we're already talking that, hey, the protein has already been made. We've, we've lost regulation up top. We have regulation right on the protein. The cool benefit about this, sorry, let me go back this one. The cool benefit about this, because they are a modification, is that the protein is already present and it's ready to do the job. That means that you don't have to wait for genes to get made, proteins to get translated. You also have, um, so you have this really strong uh, and very fast dynamic where you can turn this protein on or off. The other benefit about it is um, if you did it the old school way, where you just make a protein, do your signal, whatever you need to do, and then you have to get rid of it, cut it up, and digest the protein. And you know, if you get the signal, you have to, you know, put the amino acids back together. You have to make RNA and all that task. Mm -hmm. Here, with these modifications, what you can do is you can have a protein ready to go, send in the signal, modify the protein, get it to do its job, and you can modify it to basically slow it down again. And then, whenever you get a new signal, you can reset them up. So, its phosphorylation is super fast, and you don't basically save energy. So, if you like a tool, you can just keep using it over and over. So now we're looking at um, one of the modifications that you can basically happen to one of, to the proteins. In this case, the blue is looking at our um, uh, amino acid chain. What we're looking at here is going to be um, how the protein is basically getting already bonded into our plasma membrane. All right, so now we're linking it up or we're anchoring it to the plasma membrane. So this already happens in the ER. It happens kind of early on when you're starting to make the protein. Right? And then, um, what it's doing it, you'll be linking it to one of its, to one of its uh, basically um, uh, through the C terminus, so it'll be like the C site, so that end of the protein, you can move it into place. Now you're going to be able to anchor it in that spot. There, in the ER, right, so this is still in the ER, you're going to get this early thing. You're also going to get early like oscillations. So you're going to start adding sugar molecules to your protein. Then as it's going through the ER, Basically, in each kind of like little cluster of sisters that you're picking up, there'll be different levels of modifications, right? This one is the short version in the book. They can actually, they actually show you how these have like little networks where it'll be like, there's your protein, you glue the sugar to it. It starts like a very big like branching of sugars and then it starts getting trimmed and modified, right? Depending on what sugar molecules you put into it, 
you'll change the properties of the protein. And you'll see this kind of stuff, right? But putting sugar molecules, if you have um, like hydrophilic amino acids, they kind of don't want to interact with water, right? When you, when you bring in sugars, they have a like six carbon chain and they have hydroxyl groups sticking out, alternating, alternating like up or down, right? They call it a little six molecule. That means that it helps you bind with water. You want to find you, you, the more you add, you find them in the right places, basically, you change how your protein will behave in the solution. Um, the other one is again, if you kind of imagine again, you have a protein that was very hydrophobic, right? In the water, it's not going to want to interact with water. They normally end up clumping up with each other, right? Hydrophobic will find hydrophobic, and they'll clump up. At that point, if you clump up your protein so much, they really can't. Find targets, you might block it directly, uh, like their catalytic sites. So, by adding the sugars, you basically make them more soluble, they clump up less with each other, it makes it easier for them to work. Um, the other one is um, these modifications are also um, useful when it comes to, um, to, to signaling in the sense of like a cell kind of presents proteins and sugars on its cell surface. But so sugars that it makes, proteins that it makes, it puts them, pops them out on the outer part of the cell membrane, right? These things are normally recognized by things extracellularly. Some of these things are like our own immune system tries to go and find different target cells. If they're not ours or the native, it will try to get rid of them. Some of those reactions use these sugars or these modifications that we make. And that lets our immune system know that those are our cell types. And then, um, I need to look this one up. I forget how this one works exactly. Um, I remember, so I remember there was one where you can get, um, like the mother's immune system recognizes the embryo and it doesn't recognize the sugars and it'll start attacking it thinking it's foreign material. But let me look that one up and then I will have a little bit So here, the modifications, they're in an ordered fashion. They're coming through these different, uh, different domains. You don't need to remember any of the actual, like, how they get modified. Just know that it's getting modified. And then the big thing about that modification process is, is it's not like every protein that moves through this pathway gets every single type of modification, right? All of these modifications are, are based on that, that big principle. There's enzymes that are grabbing onto a protein, grabbing onto the sugar, and help catalyze the reaction. So because those enzymes have those specific shapes, it's going to pick a specific target of a protein, right? And then different modifications, you can also use it to um, Attack the different proteins and be like, hey, if I gave, like, say, this group of girls, they'd be like, they got that sugar, they got a different sugar. The downstream enzymes recognize those sugar modifications, be like, hey, those, that, those, that set of group should go to this organelle, and this one should go to a different organelle. Like, it'll help you kind of time or sort them. All right. So, here, again, in the book, they're going to go heavy into this N linked and O linked, right? And then I show you this big, uh, like long network of. How we're getting this starting in the ER, and how we're pushing this, and how they modify our trend so as we go through the golden trend. Um, I don't need you to memorize the sugar, it's just going to get modified, I'll be fine. For the N and O, the only thing they really mean about that is if you look at their R groups, right? So serine and threonine, they both have oxygen groups. So that means that that's where they do the O type glycoprotein, right? So glyco sugar and protein is your protein. So O type and then aspirate, aspiragine. That one has this amine group over here, and that's the one it uses to do it. So here, that's the one they showed right there. Put your amino acid, put your protein, and then put your N group. That's how you do it. Yeah. So this you can build up this little side network sticking out of your protein. So uh, one more thing that they can do with this, um, with these kind of sugar molecules or sugar tags that kind of help the protein is in the case of protein folding. So if the proteins aren't folded all the way through or properly folded, they change the way that they present the sugar molecules, right? So then that sugar molecule basically helps you serve like your tag or your recognition ring for this enzyme. Right? And again, this guy's doing the task. It's going to recognize the sugar molecule. This will be like its catalytic site, which will be it'll bind the protein now to change its conformation. Um, you can modify the folding. Um, so to give you one more tool of you can use binding to make something happen, right? And that binding, because this has a special shape, it's gonna recognize a specific type of sugar. 
had a better site, again, it's going to be specific to the person that is working with. So I think it will be a specialized modification for each person. This one, this tag, as you're doing the advance, it's pushing forward. It could also, so if everything goes well, you'll fold the protein, it looks at the proper shape, you'll send it out, and it'll move on um, in its pathway to its function, right? If the protein doesn't work or it's improper, you can still use the sugar molecules will be your signals to tell you that something's not right, and you can put it back into, you'll remodify it, and you try sending it to that folding molecule one more time, right? So they have like this repair mechanism to make sure that it's getting done properly. Um, what's it called? Um, in that pathway, right, you can have, hey, it got sugar modified, we're making the protein, everything goes well, let's send it out to go do its job. You have this alternative route, which is like, hey, you've, you've made it, you have the sugar, you try folding it, but for some reason it doesn't stick well to itself, it's not doing the right shape. You keep trying over and over, right, to fix that protein. Then the final route is, if you keep trying to fold it over, over and over, and it's not working, that's when you're like, let's get rid of this thing because it's not working properly. Like there's something big or something wrong with this. And then this will be this uh, ER associated degradation factor. So these will recognize the sugar, they'll recognize the protein itself, and you're basically going to carry it to go get it sensitive degraded. Right? And that'll be our printer product. If we can't fix it, let's just trash it. But normally the cells are pretty cheap to try to avoid doing this as much as possible. Um, but then we see you take this out, and here we have these proteasomes that literally just start chucking them up back to their base of amino acids. All right, we have. Let's jump to the next tag. So for this one, this will be your, your, your bit of donation. So this was pretty cool. Again, it's, it's picking um, the side chains of your amino acids, right? You have your protein that's coming in. These regulators, one, two, and three. There, there, there are multiple complexes. One of them does the recognition of the protein that, that you're targeting. And it also helps catalyze this binding of that small protein to get this little green thing. The next the goal is you're going to transfer it, you're going to put it onto your protein, and it's going to get tagged. Um, my friend did a lot of work with this one. It was pretty cool. It was that he figured out that some people saw that it's ubiquitation. It all, it, sometimes some of the cells did use it as a temporary tag, like phosphorylation, where they put one or two ubiquitin tags on it, and it would slow down its function and it get it not to work so well. And what he saw was that in the cases where he saw something like this, where the ubiquitin tag kept getting building up on that site. So you get more molecules building along like this. And these poly ubiquitin ones were the ones that the cells kind of knew this is going to get sent out to get trashed. Right? At that point, it's like, let's get rid of this protein. And you have an end your proteasome, and it's basically grabbed off to again, you acid sequence, and just starts peeling into smaller and smaller tag yeah. And eventually, you get your e So this one, I kind of like it in the sense that. It kind of behaved like phosphorylation, right? On and off switch, you can use it to regulate how the protein functions, but at the same time, if you build up crazy amounts of lubrication, it sends it out to get trashed. Um, and it also blocks up the function. But up here, this is where I, I said, like from, from his work that I was looking into is on this side, there's regulation of how they pick which um, which proteins they're gonna target, right? So the process of regulating this actually happens up here. When you're using the these enzymes that are going to be regulated. Yeah. All right. Let's go with this one. And then here there was a, they talked a little bit about again the, the 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 different types of sugar modifications you can add to each protein will kind of help it work in a specific environment. Um, I think I'm gonna remove this slide. Just because I want you guys to know the general idea that the sugars help serve as tag for soil. <coughs> you don't need to know exactly which sugars are required to send them into each department. Yes. Um, so the purpose of the ubiquitation is to target them to get removed or to get destroyed? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's something that sets them apart from phosphorylation, where it's like phosphorylation tag. It could be a positive thing, right? It could help them work out better. And here, ubiquitation is something that's a, it's a, it's a Either we stop you process or we or we're gonna go to destroy process, depending on how much you pick it in case. So you got like two stages of, the, of destruction. All right. These I just wanted to bring them up just because I saw I had them in the beginning and didn't bring them up. It's um these aren't as so the top one, the first one is you can modify the shape of the proteins, right? 
Um, these normally happen very early on. They're also happening in ER. The first one I want you guys to look into is this one's the protein that's sulfide isomers, so the PDI. Okay. But what this one's doing is you're basically grabbing your amino acids, your cysteines, right? They could be located around the parts of protein. And what you do is you basically are making this like sulfide brine. Uh, this one uh, basically helps glue both of the cysteines together, and you make this little bridge like that, a little sulfur bridge. Okay. What that's doing is you imagine your, 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 your protein is basically made of a single long linear chain, and you have to kind of build it up to give it its own shape. How you glue these molecules will end up bringing different regions of this protein into its proper shape. Some of that times it means like bringing in this one plus together. Other times it can be like within the own DNA binding domain. You need to be able to give it that two D. Like they're gonna reorganize like they have two off like this, like this, and they'll have a third one going over the top. You need to make sure that you give it the right bends, give it in the right position. The other thing that happens here, we're going to be talking about is going to be the okay, peptidyl propyl isomer. That's the one where the um, a proline it has a little bit like a small molecule, it can glue back its own, its own carbon chain. I'm not going to go too heavy into that one, so let me let me figure that one out. <coughs> that one's not that fun, but this bottom one, this one is a lot of fun. Um, proteolysis, right? So, this means you're cutting up the amino acid chains. So here, this is a really cool one. I think some people here mess up about insulin. So in this case, when you first make the peptide, it's going to be a longer amino acid, right? Um, and I really like this one because it's set up where in the front, it has this thing called a signal sequence. And basically in the organelle, sorry, in the, um, in the compartment you are making insulin, this sends it so the protein can get made and they can split into the proper environment. Right? So the signal is to get it to that spot to get made. Once you start working and trying to make the protein, what you do is you don't need these signals anymore. It doesn't actually help you. And that's where actually you get cut off. You can see how we have shorter fragments of that. The other part is the, uh, oh, sorry. So this one, this is the main part. I'm going to bring this more up once we get into signaling, but Leaving the proteins, in this case, is, it helps with signals. In other cases, when they leave the protein, it's like they'll um, sometimes do the cleaning to change their function, almost like phosphorylation. Right? So, you, know, you have a DNA binding domain, you might have an activation domain. You clean the back of that protein, now you're just going to have a DNA binding domain. Technically, it makes it a repressor, not an activator. Mm -hmm. You can switch its job by taking out the like, critical parts. So, those are two pretty cool ones. I'll bring those up a little bit. And then I think those are my big notes for today. Any questions today about purpose? No? Everyone's feeling comfortable with the, the general idea of how all these things are modifications for either on or off, or sometimes it's off or destruction. Yeah. All right, cool. So I'm going to call it early today. If you guys have questions, send me an email. Thanks, guys. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.